teenagers, who'd have them? Well, I did three of them. So I've experienced how the sweetness of, I love you, Daddy, can turn into the bitterness of, I hate you, Dad, less than a decade later. But it's nothing new. In Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale, a shepherd complains that a couple of teenagers have frightened his sheep away. He says, I were there were no age between ten and three and twenty, or that youth would sleep out the rest, for there is nothing in the between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancientry, stealing, fighting. And we can go back even further than 400 years. Listen to this. Children now have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect to their elders. They contradict their parents. They gobble up dainties from the table. They cross their legs, and they tantalize their teachers. Now, that is Socrates over 2,000 years ago. But to my generation, the archetypal teenager has to be that of Kevin. <laughs> Harry Enfield's wonderful creation, who took the best part of a day to clean his father's car, and whose idea of tidying his bedroom was kicking the dirty clothes under the bed. But it all passes, doesn't it? Mine are all fine now. It's just a phase, isn't it? Maybe. But at the turn of the last century and following it, a lot has gone on in the area of brain science, which informs us about teenagers and what goes on up here. A lot of behaviors can now be explained, and scientists are still very much learning. Today, I want to share three aspects of this neuroscience with you and finish with a suggestion to parents like myself and to teachers like you. The first of these concerns the prefrontal cortex, the PFC, this part at the front of the brain that's like our decision-making center. I like Robert Winston's description of it. He describes its role as the part of the brain that stops us stealing a chip from somebody's plate as we walk through a restaurant, despite the fact that we're feeling hungry. Now, in the actual TV episode where Kevin morphed into a teenager, his father observed, he's losing the power of rational thought. Now, Harry Enfield probably didn't realize just how close to the truth he was. I'm going to tell you the story of Phineas Gage, railway worker. Now, back in the 1840s, when the US was extending its communication routes westward, this 20-something young man's job was to place explosives to blast through mountains. Now, in order to do this, he put dynamite into a drilled hole, had an assistant come along and cover it with sand, and then compress the sand into the hole to ensure a confined blast. And in order to do this, he used something called a tamping iron, okay? About four foot high, about an inch in diameter, sharp at the end he held it, flat at the other end in order to compress it into the, the, the hole, the sand. Now, one September afternoon, his assistant forgot to place the sand in the hole, a mistake that Phineas needed like a hole in the head. Because what happened was, the tamping iron blew back, entered his left cheek, and exited his head out of the top, taking a piece of skull and quite a bit of brain matter with it. Phineas was blown back, and the tamping iron flew javelin-like and landed about 20 meters behind him. But Phineas got up, walked to a nearby cart after speaking rationally to his men, and then got driven home, where he waited about half an hour until a doctor came and patched him up. Now, he recovered enough to exhibit himself and his tamping iron all around the country, including at P.T. Barnum's New York Museum. 
And then he started looking after horses. Uh, he moved down to Chile, where he worked in the livery stables. And eventually, he died in California some 11 years later. But in the interim, his personality changed from a likable young man to somebody who was untrustworthy and had fits of temper when he didn't get his own way. Sound familiar? Our understanding of the human brain, and particularly of the PFC, came on leaps and bounds, that we could lose a substantial amount of brain matter and continue to be a walking, talking human being became apparent. And that this frontal section of the brain is responsible for character and personality also became apparent. And this was no more horrifically illustrated than in the middle of the last century when some scientists used this knowledge to deliberately disable the frontal lobes in order to cure mental illness. In the US alone, between 1936 and 1978, some 35,000 lobotomies were conducted. Thankfully, we don't do that anymore. What we do have is MRI scanning. Now, when it was first invented back in the 70s, a scan would take several hours. Now they take several minutes. And a chap called Jay Geed set the neuroscientific ball rolling when he conducted a study using MRI scanners with, with children. He discovered, against all knowledge, that around the time of puberty, we get an extra set of neurons. This completely wasn't understood until he discovered this. Now, what then happens is, through a process called myelination, pathways that are used are reinforced, a, a bit like lagging pipes. Okay? Now, Jay Gee calls this the use it or lose it stage. So, myelination starts at the back of the brain and works its way forward. So the last area to mature is this, our PFC, the decision-making center, which is why you are as well asking your teenager why they left the gas hob on as asking your puppy why it messed on the carpet. <laughs> Teenagers are bad at making decisions, and now we know why. The second aspect introduces us to another scientist, Deborah Jurgelen Todd. Now, she conducted an experiment using MRI scanners. She put adults and teenagers into them and showed them pictures in order to see which parts of their brains they used to interpret what they saw. Here's one of the pictures. Now, all adults shown this picture interpreted it as fear. Half the teenagers who saw it interpreted it as sadness, shock, confusion, or anger. Why? Well, what Jürgen and Todd discovered was that adults used the prefrontal cortex to interpret what they saw, whereas teenagers used their amygdalas, obviously avoiding using the PFC because it's still a work in progress. But what's the amygdala for? mostly for providing emotional rather than rational responses. So not only are teenagers avoiding making decisions when they do make them, they're often using the wrong parts of their brains. The third aspect of this that I want to share with you involves the cerebellum. Now, although it's at the back of the brain, it too doesn't mature until our early 20s because it continues to grow during the teenage years. Jay Geed links the cerebellum to what he calls higher thought, maths, music, philosophy. So it's entirely possible that taking part in sport, or maybe even just running around, can stimulate learning at this higher level. It's interesting to hear this link between physical activity and learning, something many of us have felt intuitively to be true. 
and Socrates was right to complain that children were chattering rather than exercising. So what can we do with all this knowledge? Firstly, I'd suggest, don't ask teenagers questions that begin with the word why. Rather, get them to recount their behavior to you. Get them to tell you what they did. You'll arrive at the same place in the end, but perhaps without challenging what may have appeared as an irrational action. Secondly, avoid questions that contain more than one concept in them. There's enough going on in the teenage brain already without adding more confusion to it. R remember, the teen brain, when faced with something new, will often offer an emotional rather than a rational response. Keeping things simple reduces the likelihood of the teenager defaulting into fight or flight mode. And in terms of reinforcing the pathways, the advice would be to give rests. Allow the teen brain time to take in and retain. So here's the thing. I promised a suggestion, and it's this. Why don't we tell them? Why don't we share some of this knowledge to give them maybe some understanding and maybe even control of their own development? There's a lot talked these days about motivation and its impact on learning. And obviously, motivation is now known to be closely linked to identity. A greater openness to understanding ourselves leads to a greater openness to improving ourselves. Maybe if we gave them a little bit more information about what was going on, it could help them. It certainly couldn't hurt. Thank you.